Hey, Ben Lippin, middle and high school students. Uh, thank you for tuning in with us again for our third online chapel. I'm super grateful to have my good friend Antoine Burgess back, who's a youth pastor at, at Summit Church in North Carolina. Dude, I'm stoked you're back. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It was a joy to be with you guys last week, and I am looking forward to our time together today. Yeah, so if you missed last week, uh, Antoine unpacked God's heart for unity and traced throughout the Bible how our God is passionate about uh, people living as image bearers, treating others as image bearers, um, and seeking to, to be unified and to be reconciled and uh, to live really in light of God's design. And so this week we're going to focus on an area of disunity and, and really some practical means by which God um, has equipped us to, to strive for unity. And, and that, that kind of narrow topic is the area of racial reconciliation. And uh, Antoine, I know, man, just from past conversations we've had that it's a, it's a realm you're passionate about and that you've got a lot of wisdom and insight into. And so I'm grateful that, that our students at Ben Lippin get to hear from you on this. Let me kick us off with prayer and we'll have a few questions and, and kind of just process a little bit. So Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you that, um, that Antoine's back with us and thank you just his, for his heart um, that your truth would be loud and clear and that it would inform the way we view people and the way we treat people. Um, I just pray that this time would be profitable, that your spirit would be at work um, even through an online chapel, that, that your spirit, the Holy Spirit would stir in our, in our hearts as we hear truth and that you would help us to see ways in our own lives, God, where um, our heart should align with yours when it comes to um, fighting for racial reconciliation and fighting for passion. And so be with Antoine as he shares, give him wisdom and clarity. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Antoine, give us a little bit of um, background. I, I knew, so you grew up in Lake City in a predominantly African-American context through your high school, through your church. You went to Coastal Carolina and were playing football there, and then you made a switch and came to Columbia, uh, came to CIU, and you found yourself at CIU for the first time ever in just a totally different experience where you all of a sudden were, were a minority. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience as a minority at CIU, as a minority at your church here in Columbia, which just so happened to be the same church I grew up at. Um, what was it like for you? Yeah, so my time at CIU was definitely unique and a new experience for me. Like you mentioned, I grew up in a town that was predominantly African American. Uh, it's actually like 71% African American. And so growing up, all of my neighbors, the majority of my teammates and classmates, were African American. Um, and so my norm was the norm. Like I, for my entire childhood, I never had a situation where um, I felt out of place or like I didn't belong because of my skin color specifically. And so uh, with that comes a lot of comfort. Um, with that comes a lot of ease um, in regards to relationships. Um, mm -hmm. Because um, yeah, typically we thrive in settings where we feel most comfortable. Um, and most times we feel comfortable in settings with people who look like us, who talk like us, who share uh, common interests, people who, um, yeah, like people who are like us. We are typically more comfortable in those settings. And so that was the makeup of my childhood. Um, and I never really had any difficult situations in regards to race. Like I was never like called out of my name. I was never disrespected or anything like that. Uh, uh, I, ne I, didn't, I didn't have any of those experiences. And then I go off to Coastal Carolina University, which is a fairly diverse school, um, ethnicity, um, and also just culturally speaking, you have students from all across the board at Coastal Carolina University. And for me, uh, most of my teammates were African American. Uh, most of my friends at CIU, I mean, at uh, Coastal Carolina, were uh, African American. 
Um, I, I mean, I had some white teammates and friends, but uh, but we all had like a common interest uh, in football. And so because of that common interest and also because like most of my teammates and friends were predominantly African-American, it was once again, a comfortable setting for me. Um, I was still sort of in the majority context. And so that was a, like I said, a comfortable uh, time in my life. And then when I transferred to CIU, uh, CIU was radically different <clears throat> than anything I've ever experienced. Uh, that was the first time in my life that I was a minority. That was the first time in my life that I was in a setting where <clears throat> most people didn't grow up the way that I did. Uh, most people didn't have the uh, shared experiences that I had. Uh, most people didn't enjoy the same TV shows, the same uh, music, the same uh, genre of movies. Uh, it was a completely uh, different context for me. <clears throat> um, but at the same time... Uh, just to give you an idea of the difference in that context, he started listening to, to James Taylor music during our time at CIU. <laughs> I started listening to some mom music with me. So <laughs> Yeah, I think like one That's of the first different. time I listened to country music as well was with you. Um I I still listen to James Taylor, but I can't do the country <laughs> music. So um but um but yeah CIU was totally different. Uh, a ton of kids who grew up on the mission field. Um a ton of kids who came from uh, homes uh, um where their dad was a pastor. Um, and for me, the context I grew up in, that just wasn't the case. We didn't have a ton of missionaries. Uh, there were not a ton of churches where a lot of kids, parents, dads were pastors. And so, um, and a lot of them also grew up in Christian schools. Uh, um, that wasn't the case for me. I went to a public school. And so those are two different um, contexts, um, similar issues, but different contexts. Um, and so... Yeah, my first couple months, I would even say up to my first year at CIU, um, I felt like I was constantly just trying to find my place, constantly trying to find where I belong, uh, because there was not many, well, there were no uh, pockets of just uh, minorities. There was no, like, pockets of predominantly African-American uh, people. There was no setting for that. And so for me, I, I had to like navigate this tension of like conformity, like conforming to the culture around me versus continuing to be myself and existing in diverse relationships. And so at first, you know, it was, it was fairly difficult. Well, throughout my time at CIU, it was difficult uh, being a minority, but at the same time, um, man, I, 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 by God's grace, um, I knew that the people there loved me. I knew that uh, my friends genuinely wanted to be my friends. Um, I knew that they were not um, uh, going to, you know, tear me down because of my skin color, to tear me down because I didn't have the same experiences they did. And so for me, although it was difficult, I was able to allow my classmates and my peers and professors uh, to love me. Um, I think specifically about our friendship. Uh, Chad and I were roommates, I think soph so sophomore year, junior year. I can't remember, but um, Too long. it was in that time that uh, you said what? Just messing. I think it was junior and soph sophomore and junior year, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was more like his mom than his roommate. But anyway, um, it was in that time where uh, like Chad and I were spending more time together. Um, like I was going over to his house. We were going to the same church. Um, yeah, we had a lot of time to get to know each other and to hang out. Um, and it, during that time together, um, man, Chad appreciated the person that I was. Um, Chad appreciated uh, my background, uh, my culture, my heritage. Um, and there was not a moment where, uh, you know, Chad tried to convince me to conform to, to his way of life um, and, and like making mine inferior to his way of life or anything like that. And so I trusted Chad. I trusted that he loved me. Um, and also, too, I trusted his love for the Lord and his love for the word. 
um, which in my view, I feel like when those two things are there, there's going to be a love for people. Um, and so I allowed him to know me. Um, I allowed him to truly be my friend. And so although it was difficult, it was a, it was a difficult time, me being a minority, um, um, I think God really blessed me with some phenomenal friendships um, and some people who truly loved me for the person that I was. And so that made it slightly easier to navigate, but at the same time, there were some uh, difficult moments during my time at CIU. Um, and so in regards to passion, uh, I think my time at CIU really played into my passion for seeing the, the people of God, seeing the church, uh, walk in the unity that has been purchased through the blood of Jesus. Mm. Uh, uh, during my time at CIU, I often would think back to like my church experience growing up. I went to a predominantly African American church, um, but also in my town, you had uh, uh, predominantly white churches uh, and you had predominantly black churches. And so there, there was not much unity and diversity amongst churches. Um, and then when I get to CIU, I see a school um, that is a Christian school uh, with a low minority percentage, um, which by God's grace over the past couple of years, I grad we graduated in 2015, but over the past couple of years, it's been really cool to see that number increase at CIU and the diversity uh, that has been established on that campus through intentionality, I think, of leaders um, and professors and the student body. And so I am honored to be um, you know, part of CIU family and to see that uh, diversity number increase. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was during my time there where I saw the low percentage of minorities represented on campus. And I think it was my junior year where I was really challenged to think through why is that the case? Why is there division um, and seem like a separation between the people of God. Why is the statement that Dr. King made in the 60s still relevant, that the most segregated hour um, is at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings? Like, why is that the case? And that led me to really look into our history um, and really see uh, the ugly parts of our history. Um, and uh, if you are thinking rightly about history, we know that the present is shaped by history. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I think are established today that has to do uh, with the history of our country and specifically in the U.S. between um, whites and blacks. Um, the, 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 the ugly history that exists there that makes it difficult for believers to engage as one and to uh, walk as one when it comes to being the body of Christ. And so recognizing that and also seeing in the scriptures like we looked at last week, okay, God is calling his people to be one, but yet we have a history that is causing us to walk in division. And in my mind, it's like, okay, something needs to be done about that. Like we need to be talking about this. We need to be, uh, you know, having these tough conversations to figure out, okay, why are we not walking in the unity that already exists? And so that led me to just start researching and, you know, see what pastors and, and scholars who are already out there who are doing the work of uh, addressing uh, the division that exists within a church and seeking to uh, come up with solutions um, for the body uh, to walk in the oneness that has been purchased through the blood of Jesus and so just started reading and um, listening to lectures and um, from uh, different professors around the country and listening to sermons and uh, even uh, went to a conference um, surrounding this topic. And so, um, so yeah, I would say yeah, that, that was my experience and, um, and that's what kind of led to me being passionate um, about this topic. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really, really helpful, especially for for someone like myself who is, I've been in Columbia for my life and um, in a predominantly white context for my whole life. And so I've never lived that experience of being the outsider in a sense. Yeah. Um, like you'd say at CIU, you didn't feel like you were 
necessarily treat it as an outsider. It's just those shared experiences, um, right. just different. And 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 what you're saying is you feel it like you feel when you walk into the doors of a church that's 98% um, white people, you feel like, man, I'm the outsider here. And, right. um, and I, I think it, I think it's really good for us, for us to be mindful of the fact that that's reality, you know, that is reality, whether we've experienced that reality or not, it is a reality for people. For minorities all across the world and as Christians we should be going above and beyond to make people feel like they belong to make people feel accepted to ask questions right. to seek to understand before we seek to be understood to right. pack our minds full of biblical truth and and get in line right. with God's heart that is man I'm a God of the nations I'm a God who's going to purchase people from every tribe tongue nation and language to myself um and and so what would you say are some practical ways that um that people can embrace minorities and look out for them and what are even some ways that you felt that at ciu or or in columbia when you were at um St. Andrews? like i'm just curious to hear that yeah i think one um not seeing minorities as um, inferior um, or like a project um, because I think it can be viewed like, oh, I have to make them feel welcome. If not, you know, they're going to be upset. And yeah. so I need to do something about that. Like, no, it's like, I want to be in a relationship with you. Yep. Um, and that doesn't mean you're going to be best friends with everyone. Um, but when I engage with you, I'm going to love you. Yeah. I'm going to tear you down. Um, I'm not going to make uh, just jokes about your skin color uh, because the fact is like, it is just, it doesn't make sense to make fun of someone about something they can't control. Um, and, and it and doesn't make sense to make fun of somebody over something that God celebrates. Like right. God, right. You know? like how boring would the world be if we all look the same, you know, right. and, and God is a God of diversity and color and difference. And that's how he designed us anyway sorry I cut you off but yeah no you're good brother um and so yeah man I, I think uh man not seeing them as an inferior or a project um but no like genuinely wanting to be in a relationship um and I think too uh that probably would be more towards like uh the majority um and I would say this right the second one points to is for minorities and those who are in the majority uh culture is we are not called to conform. And so conformity should not be um, a part of our pursuit. And what I mean by conformity is me as a black male saying, hey, I got to get rid of my culture and I have to get rid of what I know and I have to adopt your culture. I have to become like you in order to fit in. That's not diversity. That's conformity. And God is, I don't think God is glorified in that. I think God is glorified when me as a black male, I can come in and I can listen to the music that I enjoy. I can talk about those things and you as a white male, not telling me, hey, you shouldn't be talking about that or um, man, that's not the type of music we listen to. This is what you should be listening to or you shouldn't wear those type of shoes. These are the type of shoes that you should wear. You said, nah, bro, those, those are cool. Uh, like, tell me about that and then you have yours and I'm like, Sweet, tell me about that. Like we are celebrating and valuing the difference in one another. So we are not called to conform. And so there should not be conformity amongst believers, uh, specifically conformity to other cultures. Our conformity is to Christ. Um, I am conforming to the person um, of Christ that I see in the scripture. That's what I'm seeking to become like not another culture, not an, another ethnicity. I am the person that God's created me. I'm a, I'm a black male. Uh, I enjoy um, what I enjoy from a food standpoint. Like I love soul food, but at the same time, and I, I love Mexican food as well. Um, like one of the, like a dish I never had before. What's it? Uh, chicken Devon. 
Oh yeah, um, that your mom make like is, is now one of my favorite dishes. Like that's not me conforming. Like, I just enjoy something that came from uh, that's more common. I would say probably in your culture, something that you grew up with that I didn't. And man, I enjoyed it. You didn't tell me, hey, you should stop eating what you eat. But it was like, no, nah, man, this is something that we eat. And I went over and I enjoyed it, and that was one of my favorite dishes. And so, um, yeah, be who you are. Don't con- don't conform. Um, and then I think the third thing that I would say is. Um, Man, uh, listening to those around me, um, listening to those who don't look like me, those who don't talk like me, um, and seeking to know them, like seeking to know their stories, seeking to know why they feel uh, the way that they feel. Learn how to ask good questions. Um, Don't automatically assume their experience or don't automatically assume the way that they are thinking or don't assume that you know, just because they're hanging out in a relationship with um, a majority crowd, that is easy. Um, and ask questions, figure out, man, hey, how's, how's your experience here? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, man, I think, um, you know, not viewing people as a project um, or inferior, um, not conforming uh, to a culture that, uh, or ethnicity that God didn't create you to be a part of, um, and then three, uh, and listening to one another, uh, walking in true uh, relationships, um, walking in humility. Um, so yeah, those are some. There, I mean, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Those are just three things that comes to mind. I love that, man. I love that balance of, like you said, being who you are, um, celebrating your culture and recognizing there's only one call to conformity as Christians and that's conforming to the image of Jesus, you know, like yeah. by his spirit, as we're in his word, as we're with his people, the goal is conformity to Jesus. And we're, we're not trying to lose um, who we are and, but we, we are putting on Christ. Right. We are seeking to get in line with, with him. Um, and with his mission, his cause, and what he what he's laid out as a life worth living and the best life we could possibly live. So yeah. that's really helpful. Um, and it was cool at CIU, man, to see like this. So this conversation for Antoine and I kind of emerged really after our time at CIU, just because at CIU, the way he engaged the CIU community um, was he just loved people. And he was a people magnet there and people, all different types of people from our hall to Kwanzaa house to you had I used to pick on him about just somehow he everyone was drawn to him people that he didn't even he did not share any sort of interest or hobbies and they were drawn to Antoine I think that's a testament to just your character and who you were and for you it wasn't about skin color it was about people and about loving people made in God's image um so it's been cool even after CIU to hear more and more about some of the things you wrestled with even during our time there that we necess- we weren't necessarily talking about a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's been really helpful for me in having those conversations to, to recognize I need to be more aware just because I haven't lived it and experienced being the minority doesn't mean it's not so real for so many people and challenging. Right. Um, and right. how much more as a Christian then should I try to embrace and love on people, not in a phony fake way, but by just getting to know them, you know? Yeah. And um, so uh, time is always the issue here. We could, we could talk all day, but I, I'm curious to know, like, I, I feel like every time, not every time, but often, especially you look on social media and you see, um, in people striving towards rec- racial reconciliation, it often feels like no matter their motive, whether it's a good or bad motive, that it, it, it can just cause more division and it seems like a blow up and we turn and just launching these grenades at each other. I mean, you see it all over the news, you see it everywhere. What, what, and again, I think you see people with good motive that really are seeking rec- reconciliation and seeking unity and then people that aren't. But my question would be like, how do we actually get anywhere? <laughs> like how do we actually 
create some lasting unity? Are we the ones creating it? You know, has it been created? Um, yeah. What is lasting? Because we talk about unity, but I'm like, what does that look like? And what does that even mean practically? Um, and I'll right. like to answer that, and then we're gonna wrap it up just for the sake of time. <laughs> yeah, but I think um, I think one of the unity uh, it already exists um, because um, in, in Ephesians two we see where uh, Paul says that. God has made for himself one new man. So God has already done the work through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of making for himself one new man. That's so good. the reconciliation has already taken place. The question is, are we going to walk in it? Mm. And so I think when it comes to man, how do we create a movement of oneness amongst the people of God, and we walk in the oneness that has been uh, provided for us through the blood of Jesus. And I think it's through prayer, because when I am not in a state, a constant state of prayer, I am not in a constant state of being on my knees before the Father, depending upon the Spirit. I am depending on myself. If I am not, if that's not my life, if I am not constantly on my knees, if I am not constantly in prayer and seeking the Spirit to guide me, seeking the Spirit to shape me, uh, and seeking the Spirit to uh, allow us to walk in oneness, then I'm going to be operating out of my flesh. When someone wrongs me, I'm going to be quick to end the relationship. I'm not going to extend forgiveness. I'm not going to seek to be merciful. I'm not going to seek to be uh, patient and compassionate the way that uh, Christ was to me. But instead, uh, I'm going to say, no, I don't want anything to do with you because you said one thing that was wrong. Um, and so I think the church uh, believers, uh, and Ben Lippin students, uh, and faculty and staff, uh, I think the call is to dedicate ourselves to the ministry of prayer. Because the reality is that God is the only one um, who can unite people who should be divided. Um, he has done that through Christ. Um, and he is the only one who can provide the things that we need to walk in the oneness that he has already provided. Um, and so God is doing the work. We are called to depend. Um, and so, yes, conversations like these are very helpful. They are necessary. Um, we do need to have conversations, get to know one another. Um, but first and foremost, we are called to the ministry of prayer. Um, and that's who we must be marked by. That that's, that's what we must be marked by as the people of God, prayer. And so that would be the one thing I would like to see more of when it comes to the church and believers as we are engaging in this conversation. Um, I think that is the, the answer to um, the issue of uh, division amongst the church really good do you mind closing us out in prayer so we can do just that um yeah hmm. and i know we discussed um a resource i'd i'd asked antoine kind of for for further resources and he highly recommended one that he said apart from the bible was probably his favorite and has been the most impactful for him on this topic of ra racial reconciliation so do you mind just telling us what that is real quick and showing us that book for students that want to go deeper yeah uh, it's a book titled one blood uh, by dr john perkins uh, dr john perkins he marched with dr king um during the civil rights uh, era um, and so, yeah, phenomenal book, great resource, uh, it's rooted in scripture. Um, and so um, and it's actually really fascinating. We talked last week, I think we mentioned this, but like Jesus's famous last words in John 17 and Dr. Perkins is towards the end of his life. Um, and he titles, uh, one of the subtitles is uh, Parting Words to the Church on Race and Love. And so he's getting towards the end of his life. He knows that his time on earth is coming to an end. And he wanted to write this one last book. Um, he wanted this to be his famous last word to the church. And so, uh, yeah, I think that should be enough for us to pick it up and give it a shot. So, yeah. But, uh, That's really yeah, I will. I'm excited. Uh, it's in my, you sent it to me and I have not purchased it on Amazon, but it's going to get bought tonight so i didn't i'd encourage students 
um, buy it with me, give it a read. I think it can be really, really helpful for us. And Antoine, if you would close us in prayer, man, thank you so much for being with us. Um, yep. Just really, really grateful to have you here and for students to get to hear from you. Sweet. Awesome. Well, let's pray. Um, God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for being the God who is sovereign over all, um, a God who is merciful and compassionate, and the God who came down from his throne to deal rightly with sin. The God who came down from his throne uh, to die in our place, um, that we may be one with you. Um, God, I'm grateful for the cross. Um, and I'm grateful for uh, one of the implications of the cross, which is um, my oneness uh, with my brothers and sisters. Um, my oneness uh, with the church, uh, those who don't look like me, those who don't talk like me, those who don't uh, share the same background as I do. Um, God, I am grateful um, that I get to walk in harmony and in oneness with the church um, and that I have brothers and sisters across the world. I specifically want to thank you for my brothers and sisters that have been living, um, those who uh, physically I've never met and some I probably will never meet on this side of heaven. Um, but God, we will worship you together around the throne. And I am grateful for them, and I love them. And God, my prayer for Ben Lippin and their school, their students, faculty, staff, um, is they will pursue uh, oneness. They would uh, pursue unity. That they would be a school that is marked by love. They will be a school that makes that makes much of you. Um, and they will be a school that seeks to put your glory on display um, by walking in oneness, um, the oneness uh, that is modeled by the Trinity, by, by the Godhead. So, God, I, I, I ask that you would show favor to Ben Lippin, um, that it would be a school where all people felt welcome. It would be a school where um, all people um, would say that man, these people, they love Jesus. They love the word and they take it serious and they love people. Uh, God, thank you for providing this time. Um, we love you. This in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Antoine. And thanks for everyone that was with us for today's chapel. Um, grateful for each of you and know that just as a school, we're praying for our families and for our students in these, in these trying times. So blessings. We look forward to seeing you all next week.